A hundred whales on asylum from the sea, glistening beams poached in the sand. Did they dream? Did I wail to pull them in? Like ancient fishes, they claim the land, their thin sail halfway to flight. Whole pods of whales on suicide pact. We shroud them in towels and whisper, hold on. I charge the water to beckon them back. One hundred whales, we and they beached. Perhaps they'll sing the weeds of deep. And continuing on the animal theme, or well, a slightly more intimate animal, the worm. No eyes, no mouth or gut, a prince of dark, stretched seven meters long, clamped to mucosa, a crown of thorns with which to claim its place, my snug gut mate wriggling at whim, ecstatic at self-sex, I growing thin, eat for ten, provide a masticated stream, I am its moods. Through nights and blurry days, it sings out, procreate. Now we make our dream, we set loose life. Um, I have to confess that I'm originally a North Londoner. I have been here over 30 years, but I know that doesn't cut much. Yeah. <laughs> David is counting the years for me. Um, and my mother had fantasies about, it's sort of also continuing the animal theme. Uh, she had fantasies, she was brought up in the country and she never really wanted to live in London. So we had every single type of animal, including bantam chickens. And, um, we never got any eggs because they laid them in places we never discovered and we had to inject the, she was a doctor, we had to inject the males, it sounds barbaric now, with uh, testosterone or one or the other, I forget which one it is, so they wouldn't crow in the morning. <laughs> Suburbia. Beds of roses are turfed. TV boxes become nests for bantams injected to stop the crowing. Concrete is all, patching the trees, building walls so my trains can tour the shrubs on rusting rails. One brother builds the family dream, a pool, waist high, where hedgehogs dive and die. I keep pigeons, white fantails, and racers that might win me 20 pounds, breeding into piebald beasts. We clutter rooms, the eldest claims the attic, testing girls to the wail of Joan Byers. My stepfather, besotted with G.B. Shaw, has double doors fitted, brings his book to meals. My sister is everywhere. For choice enthroned before coral fires, my teenage brother sinks pints of milk, belches, and shouts at my mother, I didn't ask to be born. The shared front garden is patrolled by boys of civil servants. Timid Mr. Lawrence is heard bellowing through walls. All males yearn for a glimpse of trainee nurse Alice J. When my mother dies, one by one, we go our ways, scornful of suburbia, but we seek houses with the same sized rooms and gardens grand enough for pools. I make a sort of list of possible poems and, um, and I let intuition guide me a little bit. Uh, this is a very local poem. Um, I have a pond uh, which a friend helped me turf. Laying turf around the pond. 
We work the ground, risen up and covered in sores. The pond is held by wishfulness, the apples slung so low they bob in water. The small fish twist and turn, gulp at air. They know little of our free fall, how unheld we are, swathed in skin. Then rain falls as if through a sieve, closing the hinge of the day, as if to announce your leaving, footsteps marked with gold. With plants, you can guess intention. To be with another is a fine spun thing. Um, and the last sort of autobiographical poem, um, I sort of, it was a bit more the fashion than it is now, but I, um, in my 20s I did a lot of hitchhiking. Um, and I'm not sure I would dare do it now, but anyway, hitchhiking. Some splurge their stories, Others go about their business. A few take me on their dash through life, barely avoiding oncoming vans. Sometimes a woman driver alone will brave her fear, once becoming a kind of love on the grass mound of a service station. Some are just weird, a trucker proposing an act of sex, then letting me down into the blackest night. And the king of rides, flying above the forests of Ontario, in the wrong direction. But mainly there's the waiting, the counting of cars, the cursing, the longing for a decoy girlfriend, to give yourself to strangers, a rite of age, like the vacuum shock of that first kiss, like the pay packet with bizarre numbers or the cold forehead of a dead parent, testing if the world can bear me or I can bear the world. The nice thing about reading here um, is uh, I can write local poems or semi-local poems, and uh, uh, many of you will know know the locations. Um, and because I can't write at home, I nearly always write in cafes, and my favorite cafe was until it sadly closed the wimpy bar in Sydenham, yeah, the sigh. <laughs> and nothing really has replaced it. Summer at the wimpy. The pictures of food are glorious, our love. The pavement plastic cone could melt. I'm in company. Characters juggle change, consult themselves in careful choice, speaking as if they have one line in a Shakespeare play by which they are revealed. Mega burger, Eskimo waffle, international grill. <laughs> Fans strobe the glare, fluorescent lights in a world of a hundred suns. Songs wail from speakers. A fly swerves from chip to chip. The ice cream machine, its work done, will be drained. Behind the glass, fish, bought to beguile the young, leave the aqueous, watching moment by moment the theater of air. Um, and uh, maybe another second local poem. Um, and I want to explain, some of you will know who Matthew Cayley is because he's done readings here, but he's a very fine poet who lives in Crystal Palace. I know foreign territory, but there you go. And uh, a Broca brain is the brain that um, comes up with imaginative, it's a part of your brain that, that is imaginative. Crystal Palace Parade. Each Tuesday, climbing the road to the plateau scoured by sky, one week the girders of its tour die fell, lost in white, one week heart-shaped leaves speckle the asphalt view, one week no dawn,
just traffic lights pulsing. One week, Matthew Cayley taking his child to school, a poem like leaves in his Broca brain. One week, a camp of circus toys, Ferris wheel, a dungeon train, spinning floss machines. One week, a woman crossing, my mother, many years gone. One week, entranced by the stillness of trees, and another, dulled. The parade's tone each morning inclining my day. One week walking the green, finding a swirl of fire-molded glass in which you glimpse yourself, the avenue, the past. I think we should go wider, but um, we're still on the cafe theme. And uh, I'm afraid this is a generational poem. Um, I don't know how many here don't remember Happy Eaters. Um, uh, I was in love with Happy Eaters for a period. And, um, and they were taken over by Burger King. Um, they had a short life with Burger King, and then I think they were just shut down. But the day I wrote this poem, I met somebody with a badge that said, we love Happy Eaters, so I'm not alone. The last happy eater in the south. I see it against the dusk, a squat box, red and yellow neon, curtainless windows, copper domed lights over tables. In a corner, a biker in black leather chaps chews his all day breakfast. From a room in the back, there are giggles, pants crash, someone cries, through swing doors, Mavis appears, holding a pad, all of fifteen with spots that drop to her dimple breasts. Forty years ago, I chose. Who says the English have no food? Rubbery pancakes and from a tin, viscous cherries with a slab of pale ice cream that refuses to melt. <laughs> Um, I sadly had a, a friend die. Um, I checked in with Joe, and she's going to read a death poem as well, so I'm not entirely alone. Uh, he died a couple of weeks ago, and he was only 43. He had mental health problems. And he was the son of a close friend of mine who died two years ago, and I sort of had... Um, I was an executor of his trust, so I sort of had a role... Um, but I think I'll read, I'll read the poem that I wrote after she died, and then I'll read the poem after he died. Autumn was a week. The leaves fell and kept on falling. Then it rained so hard the water rose above the earth, a kind of benediction. In the local ward, her spine crumbled. She shrank like her mother before her, yet fought the fight she always fought. This is the way we go, some harboring a growth for years, others caught afresh. These are the stories not yet told. Tom. The son has followed the mother, son following mother, following son. Maybe they're together, the distraught aunt says. I knew him as a toddler screaming for his mum, as a teenager admired by cool girls, as a drug casualty with his brain scrambled, as a mental patient, overdrugged, until he swelled to immobility, to where his heart couldn't continue. Now he'll join his parent, the giver of life, the giver of the gift of death, in the nature graveyard, the rumbling motorway nearby, his carers and buddies bearing witness. Some we lose, and you cry, for no trackable reason but the vulnerability of life, although some foresaw it, the timing of death is always defiant. In this dazzling, harsh world, we did what we could. It wasn't enough. For a while, 
Each of the multitudinous lives in the city seems precious. Um, given the, I don't want to run you into the ground, but given the environmental crisis, I vowed to read an environmental poem at each reading, which is really quite hard because it's a terribly hard genre. Um, you know, you shouldn't in poetry really face anything hard on, uh, face on. Uh, it doesn't kind of work really well. And this wasn't originally intended as a poem about the environment. It was, in, it was a poem that I was writing about boric acid. And I don't know if you know about boric acid. It's a, it's a sort of all-purpose Victorian substance. They used it as a detergent, as a um, general cleaner, and as an, um, a, an insecticide. And so there was me thinking I was writing a poem, which I am, about boric acid, the warming. Mosquitoes swarm on a winter's day. Cockroaches crawl from cooker and bed. Black bubble ants zigzag gaps of sky, only our dreams free of them. Then the gritty storms bring locusts, a few at first. Jane, excited, calls them regal grasshoppers. They hew the, they hew the shoots and vegetables to shreds. Next, flying machines dive and bore the skin. By night and day were veiled. I knew of their coming, risen from our desire, our oil, our heat, given brittle leg and wing. The old mediations, boric acid, heptachlor, DDT, seem puny, poisoning us within. I have a new hero. Um, it's possible he saved the world. And it's unlikely that any of you have heard of him. Or maybe a few of you have heard of him. His name is Stanislav Petrov. He was a Russian. He died, I think, last year. Annihilation. All praise for the almost unknown Stanislav Petrov, a Russian last year dead at the age of 77. He detected missiles fired from American soil, but couldn't move. I felt like I was sitting on a frying pan, he said. 25 minutes to annihilation with a strange feeling in his gut, he failed to tell the high command and Andropov, but instead reported a malfunction. There are people such as this. All praise to his mum and dad, who maybe raised him to be calm, to think for himself. The satellite had mistaken the sun's reflection off the top of the clouds for Armageddon. At first, he was celebrated, then admonished for failing to record events precisely. I had a phone in one hand and the intercom in the other, he responded, I don't have a third hand. Just two more poems. I haven't written a Brexit poem. Um, when Jonathan and I were thinking about tonight, we wondered whether to, you know, some things are happening around that subject apparently. Um, I wrote a poem, I happened to be in Greece at the time of Grexit, and so uh, this is the closest I thought I had got to a Brexit poem. Um, and I don't think it's our job, sort of, as poets to, well, as I say, do things head on. And the famous poet Alice Oswald um, has written this wonderful half an hour poem, which is entirely about rain, but she wrote it the day after Brexit. And it has real echoes. Um, but interestingly, th this book has been recently reviewed, and um, uh, not this poem, but the last poem I'll end with, uh, he says is the quintessential Brexit poem. Um, okay, but not this one. The Denouement. <laughs> 
They that are terribly known, the loveless, who inhabit this space, this bara, whose culmination brought us to this point, their reputation preceding them as ours did not, whose blight upon the city squares and walls, whose terror in the night, the barking dogs, the screams that turn you blue, they wake us. Yet who these miscreants are, you couldn't tell, some wondering if they did exist at all. Our fears would build. The brain obsessed conferences were held. What could give rise to such amongst our kin, to grabbers, cutters, snatchers and their sort? Maybe they had been dropped when young from some great height. Their deeds are grave, or so it seemed. Who could save us? Who might venture out at night to witness or even stop these things? Our appeals are made to those that can enforce the law, but many speak of secret deals and wads of cash that suddenly appear for no good reason. Some harangue the leaders of the state. Perhaps incompetence has played its part. Enforcers often caught adrift. The time they cuffed a drunk who cursed too loud and let a gangster free, his orbit much enhanced. What can be done? Just when we thought a denouement might not come, we found a go-between from their bleak past, an interlocutor, a dapper man in a cold grey suit who never stopped his smile. And I'll finish with my uh, so-called Brexit poem. Um, uh, they say that the, the, the most, um, many of you have heard this one before, they say the most difficult um, uh, experiences in people's lives are breakup of relationship, um, moving house, but I reckon having a builder in your house ranks up there fairly <laughs> high. I had a builder for three months, didn't write a word. And when he left, I got a poem. The Builder. Small, aging, gimlet eyes, no English. I serve him tea, four sugars. At first, we sign my needs. As day blurs into costly day, he's less concerned. Floorboards sanded almost to the joists. Silk white walls, first grey, now black. Paint smells of him as thickening dust covers my browning plants. Corn grows in the kitchen. Some windows are painted gloss with faint reflection. Wires now cross the room, crackling. Shower heads emerge in the bathroom. The fridge hangs from the ceiling. Door glued shut. I eat wood filler and grout. He sleeps here now to save time. The phone rings less, it's always for him, often it is him. Sometimes his friends all alike jostle in the hall, but when they're gone it's too still to breathe. At night the plaster heaves and sweats, by morning, like elephant skin, it's grown an inch. Some walls almost meet. Floral mouldings have burnt and burst in the heat, my clippings, hair and sperm stuck to the walls as wood chip. One room is sealed at dusk, I'm in three rooms at once. Sometimes I am him, small, aging, gimlet eyes, no English. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> my great delight to uh, introduce Jo Bell. And Jo, I've known for many, many years, and she's had lots of different roles in the poetry world. Um, and many of you will have seen her on the nationwide ads with a, with a smashing poem. Uh, Caroline Duffy says that she's one of the most exciting poets now writing. Her award-winning work has been widely published and broadcast, well known for her mixture of mischief, melancholy, and salty humor. She's a former director of the National Poetry Day and has a wide following across the UK, both as a performer and author 
of popular terms, and I think we have some of them, such as 52 write a poem a week and how to be a poet. I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Joe Bell. Very much. Here I am with my twinkly bottom for your amusement. <laughs> Salty humour, the man says. So, um, how many of you have seen ducks having sexual intercourse? <laughs> Anyone? Right, Ma madam, would you like to describe the process? If, if, violent. If, violent, violent. It's, um, it's, it's a bit hard on the female, isn't it, really? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's rape, basically. Um, you may be wondering why I'm talking about this. I live on a boat, and uh, on a narrow boat, and so some of my best friends are ducks. Uh, and I look out of the window occasionally and find them copulating with great violence uh, underneath my kitchen window. Uh, so uh, a poem is never about what it's about, uh, as we've heard today in many cases. They're always about something else, really. Um, and so I was thinking about ducks and how I think of them, and I think of them as oiks. I am from somewhere even further north than wherever it was in North London that Gail is from, <laughs> uh, uh, as you can probably tell. And so I cast my oiks as sort of uh, chavish cockneys, really. Sorry, folks. <laughs> but here they are. There is violent language in this poem, but it isn't me, it's the ducks speaking. So, oiks. The walk may be Churchillian chin in and belly first, you don't fool me. You water cockney mallards with your nightclub swagger. I've seen you fucking in the shallows, shouting like a bus stop drunk. Your drab and scrawny twockers cruising for an open door, on patrol and on the ante, cocky as the little ships, common as muck. Over here, lads, there's some bird with a sandwich! Don't give us plates, scraped lettuce, couscous, scraps of rocket, for fuck's sake. We want bread and none of your granary shit. <laughs> what do we want? Bread. <laughs> when do we want it? Now. And now. And now. Lunchtime, you're hungover, slouching on the bank and muttering. At midnight, up for anything, a new tattooed, that stripe of Primark colour on each wing, that old-fashioned gang rape every spring. She's down. Get in. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a, uh, it's sometimes when you hear a poetry reading, you hear the poetry noise, which perhaps we could just rehearse now, which is where everyone hears something very moving and they go, <laughs> just with that, in case you never feel the need to make it again this evening. Mm, yes, you see, that's what, people don't make that noise after that poem. <laughs> I don't know what noise to make, really. Um, so, springtime. It seems to be midsummer, actually, and I was planning to read a few poems about spring, but of, of course, I have, having heard the three previous poets, completely changed all the poems I was going to read, as I always do. Uh, but this one has survived. It's springtime at the boatyard, and this is how we experience spring in a working narrowboat yard, canal side. You can keep your cuckoos. We hear spring's first song in the sound of angle grinders brazen as a mating call across the yard. The saw blades and the welders working between weathers like a nesting bird and swarf as bright as daffodils on workshop floors. You can keep your catkins. We have rust like pollen on our skins. We walk between steel shells and smell the fresh blue boiler suits of all the coming days when warmth will stretch our holes and make of summer evenings a shed for building this year's stories. Um, I've seldom been quite so conscious as I've heard the poets reading before me of my own privilege um, that I stand here as a white, middle class, uh, well educated, straight woman. There's only one of the luckiest cards that I didn't draw. Um, 
But I was asked a little while ago, we, we were uh, having various conversations in the poetry world about how different relationships are represented. And my friend Max Wallace um, was running a blog called Something Every Day, where a poem had to be written every day. And he wanted me to do a duet with him for, New Year, for uh, Valentine's Day. And Max is a gay man, half my age. And I said, how do you see this panning out, Max? <laughs> um, and he said, look, just, just do it, just respond. So he wrote a poem in response to the Yiddish proverb, when a thief kisses you, count your teeth. <laughs> uh, and his was called Thief, and it was very visceral. Ooh, it was really very rude indeed. Um, in, a, in a kind of um, seminal way, you might say. Uh, and this is my kind of response. So, so his was about the thief, and I was trying to work out whether I was um, playing a different role or not. So this is called Taken. Let's just say it was complete surrender. The wanted word is visceral. The usual exchange of fluids doesn't quite compare. He closed his eyes and tilted back his head and he was mine, as naked as a worm. He yielded like a sapling to the axe. Humility is not an asset in my trade, but such an ecstasy of loss brought out the best in me. At last I stripped. His willingness unmanned me. Such a glut of giving. It was hard to take, but oh, I took it. Breath for breath and blow for blow. I got up with the sun, gobsmacked, love struck. My keys were missing. All the doors were locked. <laughs> um, what we're all trying to do in our various different languages is, is talk to one another. And I love evenings like this where you have four voices all in one place. And you can hear what they have in common, which is the need to say, this is what I think life is like. Do you think life is like that? And when we connect with an audience, when somebody hears or reads a poem and says, yes, yes, I recognize that, something in that, sounds like my experience. That to me is what poetry is for. It, it fills the gaps where language cannot reach, which makes it really bloody hard to try and express that in words. Uh, so I was trying to do that uh, with this poem. And uh, whether I succeeded, you will be the judge. It's called Crates. Observe that when I speak of crates, your mind supplies one straight away. Likely you are thinking of the fruiterer's crate, a shallow, slattered box of rain-napped pine, the archetype of apples stenciled on the side, a cartouche slot above it for a grocer's hand. Your crate may be the sturdy plastic tub of the eco-minded council, waiting at the gate with all its rinsed tomato cans, and in this case, a drowned frog. Or, then again, the solid, beer-smooth wood hefted by the publican with its hungover slumber bottles to the yard the morning after. Your crate exists as soon as it is thought. Its shape is shown in speaking of it. Now, let us speak of love. Aha, that was the poetry noise. I heard someone make the poetry noise. <laughs> Hurrah, I can go home now. Um, love, and it's many forms, uh, and it's many failures, um, leads us to write a lot of poems, really. And I'm hoping that I can find on here uh, one for Raymond. Uh, for his forthcoming wedding. Congratulations. Um, but I can't, so instead, uh, we will have this one, which is also about a kind of love. This is the uh, foretold death poem. Uh, they come like buses, don't they, deaths? That you, you sometimes lose people very swiftly when you least expect it to, uh, and sometimes you lose two or three 
in a row. Uh, and this was for my friend Helen Cadbury, who, um, who died very swiftly a couple of years ago. The Point, it's called. Death stood at the end of my bed. You're next, he said. Just saying. He didn't look so well himself. <laughs> I backed towards the door. I heard your footfall in the hallway. Your hand slipped the latch to give us a head start. Your whisper through the keyhole. At your back, love. Take my hand and run. Two can travel faster than one. Mm. I'm not sure that's true. You never get away. Um, this is a, a found poem. I don't believe in found poems, uh, but I found one. So uh, here it is. Um, somebody brought into a place where I was working the I Ching. Has anyone played around with the I Ching and its many ways of talking bollocks? Um, <laughs> you, you let it fall open at a page and it foretells things which are really so inscrutable as to be entirely <laughs> incomprehensible. So this is the question I asked it. On asking the I Ching if I will ever have sex again. <laughs> Difficulty at the beginning. <laughs> the superior person carefully weaves order out of confusion. Supreme success if you keep to your course. Carefully consider the first move. Seek help. <laughs> Seek help, yes, that's the, that's the moral of, of all our lives, perhaps, really. Um, I thought I would read you a, a sonnet or two as well, um, but in the, in the way that has come to typify this reading, we're not going to have that now because I've pressed the wrong button. <laughs> Don't you just love technology? So instead, this is the foretold poem for Raymond. Uh, and what is Mrs. Raymond to be called? Full uh, name. Uh, yeah. No, I don't need her full name. Tab Tabitha. Tabitha, okay. So um, if this is relevant for you and Tabitha, then, then good luck to you. But it, it was written for somebody else. It was written for my dearest friend, Heather, who was approaching her 20th anniversary with her husband. Uh, and oddly enough, I knew her husband long before she did. And when we realized this one drunken evening, she looked at me in horror and said, please tell me, please tell me you have not slept with my husband. <laughs> I'm like, no, I haven't, I haven't. She said, right, in that case, can you write us a poem for our forthcoming wedding anniversary? Um, and I tried to tell it in the terms which I knew. So this is how it turned out. It's called Working Pair. I have asked for a poem about love. The woman I have asked to write this poem knows nothing about love. Of boats, she knows a little. When she tries to write of love, it often looks exactly like a boat. And so she found herself remembering a rusty day in Birmingham. From an arm of water known and so invisible to all the city drinkers came the slow nose of a narrow boat. Aries, heading for the old turn junction at an angle made for public pain. But then behind her, shark smooth, slid the, slu the snub nosed malice, hitched on short lines so that both boats took the corner in a perfect coupling, right as knee or elbow. The first was pushed around the narrow turn. The second paused, then took the rope and both moved on. Each line and angle, each response and strain was halved and doubled. This is, of course, a clumsy metaphor. The woman I asked to write this poem knows that. But it is the best way she can find to show how, moving light or laden, two bodies might help each other so that both are more than helpful. Each is needful to the other's passage. 
She cannot write a piece that will explain the love that I've laid down for you, my love. I had not known there was a home to come to till you came. He says, I haven't found a way to ask people not to clap between poems without sounding like a wanker. <laughs> please don't clap between poems. I don't care if you, you know, if you want to take your clothes off and shout and scream, please go ahead. Um, this is called Enough Deathbed Talk because after losing my friend Helen and another friend, you reach that point, don't you, where you rediscover the small pleasures of life and you stop feeling guilty about um, being alive when others are not there. Um, and I was, as you will realise, at the seaside. I was in um, Anglesey, in a place called Treatha Bay. Enough deathbed talk. The business of our days is whether to endure these gobshite hours and slingshot seconds, or to praise. The season helps. A yellow beach, wit Sunday sun on gulls and gables. Here and now, it's shallows turned to sea glass, wind-blown dogs and boats in harbour, bracken tousled on the hills, your sweat and solid body shifting in my sheets. Praise paddles in with every kayak. Sometimes it's otherwise. We wake stone still and cry for night to end the days as soon as they begin and nothing stays but dirty plates, new forms of the impossible. Scarce room then for praise. Stay close. When the clay sticks to our hectic feet, we'll pull each other up until we're clear. Address the only business of our days. Hold strong. Hold strong and hold to praise. Um, I, I have been in Gaudi's Cathedral in Barcelona, but uh, didn't do the audio guide. Uh, and I found it a bit much, frankly, don't you think? All those frills? Um, very un-British, I thought. Uh, if you want uber-British faith, you go to the Quakers. Um, and, and I am a card-carrying atheist, but the Quakers are so tolerant that they, they welcome anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you've been to a friend's house, immediately opposite Euston Station, there's a, a lovely meeting room at the back where you can go and quake every now and then. Um, but I, I was passing with my boat through a town called Bradford-on-Avon in Wiltshire, where there is quite a, an old Quaker community. And I had had one of those relationship breakups that Gail spoke about and was heartbroken and distressed. And I just went along to this Quaker meeting, and this is what happened. It's called Society... here would answer. It did not. I sat among them and I wept. An hour we breathed together. I felt dizzy and unhelped. There was a little coughing. Every now and then a slow breath in or out. The woman in the purple jacket, stood and said, Since Mary died, I have been thinking about grace. The loss of love is very sad. I have been thinking that in anguish we experience grace. We find it in the love of other people around us. She sat. There were wild flowers on the table in a pewter mug. I cannot say that I was healed. I knew, though, what she meant. Um, Raymond was also speaking about artists, the, the great artists who uh, Tabitha is working on and with long after their death. What a gig, what a fantastic <coughs> thing to do. Um, I was formerly an archeologist and, and did a little bit of conservator and curator work and it's incredible. 
Um, but I was thinking about Renaissance painters like you do, and um, thinking about Giotto. I went to see an exhibition of Giotto's stuff uh, in Italy, and um, about the many kinds of privilege and exclusion. So this story is a true story, allegedly, about Giotto. Infallible. Outside the workshop, toddlers tumbled by. They sent me here for beauty, said the courtier. Your children are so plain. Giotto laughed, a blacksmith's laugh. I made them in the dark, he said. <laughs> the envoy blushed, unsealed his errand. His holiness commands a sample of your work. Indeed, said Giotto. We will talk as soon as Pietro's roof is done. The messenger leaned in and scowled. The Holy Father's business is to speak for God. Giotto snatched the scroll, returned it with a circle, compass perfect, in a single sweep of red. God speaks by himself, he said. Um, this is a, a new genre that I have invented, which you may call the stroppy historic. <laughs> um, and again, uh, I, I'm not keen on, just as I, I don't like found poems, and I gave you a found poem, I don't like ekphrasis, and now I give you an ekphrastic poem. Ekphrasis is when you write, usually it's writing about visual art, rather than the other way around. It's, it's really when one art form responds to another, but poets do it because it's a cheap way of getting a poem out of a visit to an art gallery. Um, so this is called Eve Naming the Birds. When um, Adam and Eve were given their tasks, Adam got to name the beasts, and Eve got the birds. Uh, and there's a very beautiful Blake painting in uh, Pollock House in Glasgow of Eve, looking very surprised. I give him language, and he looks for flint. I've done the beasts, he says, your turn. I name them into shame, weeping for their loss. So the wordless world is finched and hawked, shriked and paradised into the light we make. The swans and dodos, gannets, grebes and rails. He cannot see a feather till it's lined. As if dominion were what we ought to want. As if they ought to be ashamed of merely flying. We shall name it into shape, he brightly says. Be it God or anything that's naked, we shall clothe it in a word. Now, what shall we call you? I think it, but unspoken, it is still my own enemy. From this day forward, I know he shall bruise my head and I his heel. Cheery, isn't it? <laughs> um, let's get a little bit more cheerful. Uh, once again, a poem is never about what it's about. And so, when I was asked to write a poem about how canal locks work, um, I found myself working through a canal lock with a man who, uh, shall we say, was keener on me than I was on him and wanted certain things to happen which weren't going to happen. So that permeated into the poem. What, whatever is in the back of your mind is going to find its way into the poem eventually. So this is a poem called Lifted. Uh, and if you have nothing better to do this evening, you could look it up online. There's a, there's a, a film poem of this. Uh, in which we are going up in the lock. In fact, we went down in the lock and he ran the film backwards. So if you look at the edge of the lock, you can see the little drops of water going upwards. <laughs> so lifted. The land says, come uphill. And water says, I will, but take it slow. A workman's ask and nothing fancy, will you? Here's an answer, engineered, a leisurely machine, a box of oak and stone, the mitred lock, the waters, yes, were stopped. The bow bumps softly at the bottom gate and drifts. All water wants, all water ever wants, is to fall. So we use the fall to lift us, 
make of water its own tool, as simple as a crowbar or a well-tied knot. Open up the paddles, let it down and pucker, lift, and with it, lift us like a bride, a kite, a wanted answer. The breath no longer held, or like a boat. We're on our way and rising. Water rushes in like fools. These tonnages that slip across the sill, all dirty bottle green and gathering into a giddy hurl, then slower, slow, until it ends in glassy bulges, hints of aftermath, a cool and thorough spending. Wait, then, for the shudder in the gate, the backward drifting boat that tells you there and here are equal and imbalance righted. Ask of water, help me rise. And water says, I will. Um, I was struck by Raymond talking about bird song. Um, I've often noticed that uh, when I'm doing workshops with people and helping people to write, there's always one of the five senses that they're less sensitive to, and in my case, it's sound. I am I seldom explicitly include sound in, in poems. Uh, and this was the exception, really. I, I went out on my boat with a guy called Matt Merritt, who is a wonderful poet. I really recommend his work to you, Matt Merritt. Um, oh, that's the alarm telling me it's time to go home. Um, and he is the editor of Birdwatching magazine. So uh, he, he was trying desperately to educate me on what all these birds were. And this was my reply. I only know the ones that sound like muesli, speckling the day with goodness. The ones that sound like rusty swings or a musical saw, the bomb going off, the torturer's knock at the door. The car park birds, the lay-by birds of verge and brink, these ones I know. I like the ones that sound like schnapps with gold leaf spinning in it. I like the day's last blackbird, holding up its song, a candle flame, as the street lights flicker on. Okay, I'm going to give you two more, uh, one of which includes the worst uh, pun I've ever written, uh, and a filched line from uh, John Donne, uh, and one in which you, ladies and gentlemen, have to sing, because there is nothing a British audience likes late on a rainy Saturday better than being asked to do some audience participation. <laughs> um, so, uh, this is called Your Helens and My Jonathans. Has anyone here ever been in love? No? No? This is going to go over your head, ladies and gentlemen. This isn't going to make any sense to you at all. Um, I myself have been in love more than once. Uh, and... Uh, I'm conscious that when you start a new relationship, uh, shall we say the ghosts of the old one are kind of uh, looking over your shoulder. So this is your Helens and my Jonathans, because my ex at the time had a little constellation of Helens in his past, and I had a little constellation of Jonathans in mine. <laughs> After the kitchen table, sofa, stairwell, and surprisingly that photo booth in York, <laughs> we've made it to a bed. Just you and me, and everyone we've ever slept with. Your Helens and my Jonathans, they stand like hospice visitors around the bed, garlic pale and probing, choked on spite, exchanging notes and bellowing our faults. We could eclipse them with a wink. So, love, turn on the light and look me in the eye and call me by my name. And when your tongue makes me forget that syllable, I'll summon yours until, brace yourselves ladies and gentlemen, until our ghosts are well and truly laid. <laughs> we'll honour them, but they must step aside. Um, so this is, this is where you get to sing and then we'll release you into the community. Um, <laughs> My friend Kirsty lives in a chapel which she is converting herself. She learns to glaze an 18th century window, she hoists herself up on a rope, glazes the 18th century window and hoists herself back down again. Um, and when she finished the roof, 
we had a topping out ceremony. Has anyone been to one of these? Or do they? Yeah. So it's always a surprising number of people know what that is, uh, and it's described here. Uh, but she's also a singing teacher, and so she made us sing a little bit as we got drunk and toasted the mm -hmm. roof. So, your words, ladies and gentlemen, are these. When I, when I tell you to, it's, The roof is finished, the roof is finished. Could you? One, two, three. The roof is finished, the roof is finished. Thank you, and if you could do it with the enthusiasm of people who have just finished a roof, <laughs> that would help. <laughs> Praise your thousand days of busted knuckles, backache, neckache, dusted wire wool hair, of eating cheese amongst the rubble, reading Heaney in your Wellingtons, and never a clean dress to go dancing in. Praise the day we gathered at your door to hoist a pine branch to the eaves and sang a ruddy choir under your paint stick baton. The roof is finished, the roof is finished till we were hoarse enough for beer and flames, drank each other to a charcoal drowse, settling in half-wrapped corners, here a one and there a swaddled pair, easy on the floor as hounds inside a mead hall, stationed to sleep out the hours of thunder, and as water found a way between the pitchy ridge and roof slates, sending piss-thin streams to wet the flagstones by her head. Praise the one, whichever one it was, who, laughing in half-sleep, got up and put the kettle on. It began the chorus that we took up one by one. The roof is leaking, ladies and gentlemen. The roof is leaking, the roof is leaking. Waking, placing buckets, drinking tea, hungover. And what a song for Kirsty anyway, if not to keep the roof on. Thank you. you can always tell when a poetry reading is over, there's a whole range of papers that have come out of poetry collections. Um, thank you very much for coming and for your rapt attention. Um, uh, and I would like to thank Spontaneous Productions, Jonathan, um, Geraldine, Roland, who have all helped in putting this together, and Jonathan, over the years, has done a great job in, in producing whole ranges of activities, and I'm very pleased that this is a, a poetry event as part of that. Um, uh, but mainly to thank you, and also, of course, to thank Connor, Raymond, Gail, whoever he is, and Joe Bell, uh, for really smashing that. Thanks.